I belong to a large experimental lab at Ohio University, directed by Corinne Mosier Foresight. I'm a lab theoretician, so I very closely sit with a lot of data produced by different experimental techniques. And I was thinking for years of all the problems that Ellen Ryan just talked about. And I'm going to tell you about two of those problems that come at different stages of HIV viral life cycle. So this whole lab is doing molecular biology of uh, HIV. And uh, I was able to discuss these ideas with uh, Robin Brunsma, and I'm very grateful for this possibility. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to present the naive first version of it. It's unpublished. It's idea about how uh, HIV is packaging its own genome. And then there will be probably ramifications on that. And I'm also grateful to be pleased uh, after uh, Professor Ellen Ryan talking, because a lot of what I need to introduce to be able to explain these ideas were already introduced by uh, Ellen. Uh, so among the uh, all uh, possible viruses and how they live and perform their basic function of uh, promoting their own genomes that uh, Shura Grossberg was talking about. The retroviruses are a very special niche. So of course, just like every other viruses, they need to pack their genome, they need to go out of the cell, and then they need to go and infect another cell. And at this stage, they need to uncode and to make their genomes available for replication and for translation to make their own viral proteins, right? And uh, as we know, all it's basically, as Shura was saying, three components. The nucleic acid, that is the genome, uh, the capsid that forms the shell, and probably the membrane in a lot of cases. And uh, retroviruses, they all solve this problem a little differently, but the basic thing is that the, the stability at the stage of assembly comes from the membrane. Those are enveloped viruses. And um, the assembly, as was discussed here many times, so there are two different scenarios that were discussed here generally, right? One scenario of assembly is when the capsid is, capsid proteins are interacting with each other very strongly and they assemble on their own, maybe with a little help of nucleic acid that they package. Sometimes even they don't need nucleic acid and they, the, the nucleic acid is packaged after or like even needs energy to be packed in. Right? Uh, this is one class. The other class is all that all retroviruses belong to is when the interaction with the genome, with the nucleic acid, is much, much stronger than the capsid-capsid interactions. And the assembly never happens without the genome, no matter how high salt or what pH you're using. And the capsid-capsid interactions are a small addition on top of this major, very strong interaction with nucleic acid. And the HIV is a very good example of that, and we're going to talk about that. And in fact, I believe that assembly, some sort of assembly happens even when there, there are no gag-gag interactions whatsoever. Uh, so um, after, so the other step of like uncoding happens to a completely different capsid, right? There are two different capsids. One is immature capsid before the gag is processed and cut into pieces, and the other is mature capsid, that is this cone that we've seen several times throughout this meeting. And my second story, if I have time, is going to be about the step of uncoating. This is a very interesting story that uh, Robin and I published on uh, about three years ago, but since then there was a lot of experimental interest, and I think that basically confirms this idea. And I brought a poster about that, but I forgot to put it up, so I put it as a part of my talk. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so the problems of selective packaging of HIV genome uh, was pretty much presented by Ellen very well. So the problem is that we have um, that the this gag protein that is self-assembling without the help of anything else in principle, uh, maybe the membrane or the negatively charged little molecules, AP6, that Ellen was talking about that can substitute for the membrane. So it assembles, and it assembles just as well on any random RNA, non-selectively, 
no difference in the virion assembly and even in kinetics, maybe in the lag time before assembly, if at all. And uh, in vitro, in solution, and even in vivo, there is no difference in the binding strength of the psi sequence that is a packaging sequence in genomic RNA versus any random piece of RNA. And there is a huge excess of these mRNAs that uh, Ellen introduced are packaged non-selectively in these genomes. And at the same time, the packaging selectivity for the genomic RNA is pretty high, 80 percent, 60 or 80 percent. It's not 100 percent, but it's very significant. So uh, the other problem of uh, uh, there seem to be uh, uh, conditions when there is enough gag in the cytoplasm, and you can see it by fluorescence, and it's about an equal amount in the cytoplasm and on the plasma membrane, sitting there doing nothing. There is no assembly. Uh, there seem to be a critical, uh, critical concentration of gag that is needed to initiate any sort of assembly. And the very late, uh, kind of very recent studies from Weisha Hu's lab at NIH show that if we have a genomic RNA, then at the same low uh, gag concentration, the assembly can be done. And there is a virion production that is much more um, efficient and significant. But if there is no genomic RNA, then at the same gag concentration, there is no assembly at all. And then there is this um, mysterious role of genome dimerization. We know that genome is packaged as a dimer. In this uh, little sequence that is called dimerization domain of um, genomic RNA, uh, there are complementary base pairs in the loop, well, just three, four base pairs, that are absolutely critical for dimer formation of this genome. And this is at the uh, end of the RNA. And this dimerization uh, signal is within the psi region, which is the packaging region. So it's naturally to kind of speculate that the dimerization being in the same exact place as the specific region of the genome important for packaging, that that's what's important, that they're close together and that they're forming the same specific site for assembly. But again, experimentally, when people measure in the test tube, if binding to the dimer RNA that is dimerized is stronger than to the monomer that was mutated in this uh, stem loop that, and precludes dimerization, they don't see much difference for dimer affinity versus monomer affinity. Uh, so this is the crucial experiment uh, that was done fairly recently uh, in vivo in cells that I think uh, that makes us believe that the selectivity for the genomic RNA comes at the step of assembly nucleation. So this part, so what, what is being done here, it is in vivo. People are taking, this is um, done by Sebla Kutley and Paul Binash, and uh, they are uh, taking this cytoplasmic fraction of um, uh, cell, and they're measuring, they're quantifying by RNA-PCR, uh, what kind of RNAs are in this fraction available for sequencing, essentially. And they see that there is very little of the viral RNA in the cytoplasm, just as you would expect it should be, because viral RNA is one of the, just like any other mRNA, but it's just one sort of mRNA. It's a product of one gene that was permanently introduced into the genome. So the amount of viral RNA is maybe tenths of a percent or maybe hundreds of a percent. It was detected, but you can't even tell here how little it is. And 80 percent is some cellular random RNAs, right? But then they do the same cross-linking it to GAG and watching what fraction of GAG cross-linked to viral RNA as opposed to cellular RNA. And they see that about, like, say, on average, 3% of the GAC cross-linked to the viral RNA. 3% is more than, like, say, 0.1%, right? So there is some level of selectivity at the stage of cytoplasmic binding of GAC to genomic RNA versus random RNA, right? But this is certainly not enough to selectively package, right? This is the degree of selectivity in the cytoplasm. It is maybe, you know, like, I would say, within tenfold, less than tenfold, maybe threefold. Right? However, when they do the same two experiments inside the virions, so they purify the virions and they 
analyze in the same way the content of this virions. What is the RNA in this virions, non-specifically? Now the cellular RNA constitutes about like say 20%. It's non-zero, it's significant. There are some cellular RNAs being packaged in the virion and about 60 to 80% is viral RNA. So the enrichment happens somewhere in between cytoplasmic binding of GAC and complete virion formation, somewhere in between. So it gives us idea that probably, most likely, it's a nucleation step. Because the rest of the RNA besides uh, Psi is just as good as any random RNA. There is no anything specific about that RNA that could confer the, spe the selectivity of packaging. So uh, in the same experiment by uh, Sable and Paul Binash, uh, of all of the GAGs that cross-linked to the viral RNA, that was this very small percent in the cytoplasm, like say 3%, right? They were able to uh, see what were the specific binding sites on the genomic RNA that the GAG cross-linked to. And they specifically have shown that these are the three sites in the Psi region, right? It's very um, kind of gratifying to see after everything we've heard from um, Ellen just now, that there are the, the three strong sites in the site signal for Diago, for a nucleic capsid. And they were able to map out those sites pretty well. And this mapping coincides very well with the mapping that we've heard about uh, by uh, shape analysis from Ellen just now. And also that comes from Karin Musia Foresight Lab. We do it by this um, salt titration binding studies. And we see the same pretty much specific sites in the Psi. And then uh, in our lab, they've done three-dimensional sex of this Psi, right? It's a pretty rigid, flat structure. And there is a three-way junction in the middle. And those three sites map very well to the, this three-way junction, right? By the place where three storms come out. So we'll come back to the importance of these three sites and what can it mean. Finally, we have to consider all different possibilities for selective genomic RNA packaging because it's all in vivo and in the cells, and people can't see the specificity of genomic RNA binding to GAC. They, of course, infer a lot of other proteins that are cellular proteins that can be important for this selective packaging. Some motors that drive and collect GAC in some place and not the other, or Anything you can imagine, there are a million possibilities how the selective packaging can happen. We know it doesn't happen co-translationally, that the mRNA that produces GAC doesn't get packaged. We also know that there is no compartmentalization of the uh, genomic RNA with the GAG in the cell. Uh, but this is a very simple, uh, as simple as it can get, in vitro experiment that was able to reproduce in some way the selectivity of genomic RNA packaging. This is in vitro selective packaging assay that was just recently done in Jim Hurley's lab. And what is uh, being done here, it is a giant unilamellar vesicle that in its um, content reproduces the plasma membrane composition. So it has these pips that are highly negatively charged small molecules. And it has a right composition of the negatively charged polar heads and some a little bit of um, cholesterol. So it is pretty much like a plasma membrane, right? And it is in red here. And then fluorescently labeled in white is GAG. And this GAG is looked, uh, seen as a puncta here. And then uh, co-localizing with this white puncta of GAG, there is a green uh, genomic RNA fluorescently labeled, right? And what they show is that uh, they fluorescently label different RNAs that are of different degree of specificity. This site-containing region from genomic RNA is labeled or completely random, no, not quite random. It's another region of the genome that was cr cross-linking to GAG just a little worse than the genomic, than the site region. And then there is a completely random piece of the same length. It's not a full length uh, RNA, it's just a, about 370 nucleotide. And what the we're able to show that there is a complete co-localization of GAG puncta with the genomic RNA, even when there is a tiny little bit of genomic RNA, like 0.5 nanomolar. But if uh, the, and that happens with the, any RNA, it's completely co-localizes with the puncta. But when they start adding 
uh, tenfold access of genomic RNA, the genomic, uh, the, um, uh, so the genomic RNA is able to withstand competition with the uh, non-genomic RNA, no matter how, no, even tenfold access of non-genomic RNA. But uh, if it is a specific RNA that is competing, which is in this case, then it is uh, the fluorescently labeled genomic RNA is all competed out by it. So this is what uh, I'm presenting this data because I want to show that the physics attempt to, to try to understand the selectivity of packaging involving just a membrane RNA and the GAC is not hopeless, that it is being done in the lab, that apparently you don't need any cellular proteins to do that. So this is a uh, fluorescent image of the so this is a low expression of GAC, and the GAC is about half and half uh, kind of dispersed in the cytoplasm and dispersed on the membrane. When the GAC hits certain level of expression, then most of the GAC is in form of the pretty much cluster dense form on the membrane, and there is none of it in the cytoplasm. It's a pretty critical phenomenon. So then about the assembly kinetics at all. So what people know about assembly is that the uh, genomic RNA is being picked up in the cytoplasm by very few gags that people can see fluorescently because it's just, it's below 10 gags together that do the selection in the cytoplasm. And this is this low selectivity state, step in the cytoplasm that we talked about. And then uh, the first thing, so they watch this um, assembly by turf, and turf only observes the fluorescence from the membrane, right? It's a two-dimensional thing, close to the membrane. So what people see, they first see the green is the genomic RNA coming to the cytoplasm. It comes pretty abruptly, and it probably is brought by a few gags that people can see, right? And then over a pretty long time, which is 10 to 20 minutes, there is association, gradual association of the gag with this nucleus that is being formed on the membrane. So this is a very slow, slow time that is definitely not diffusion limited and controlled by something completely different. And we also don't see a very lo long log time, uh, like a lag time that happens before this first uh, our genomic RNA that we can see on the membrane. It's a really long time and uh, sometimes it's infinite in terms of if it's a low, low gag concentration, the gag sits forever uh, before nucleating the assembly, right? So. It was also shown by Weisha Hu's lab that uh, all of the gag that gradually accumulates here in the virion comes not from the membrane. There is tons of gag sitting on the membrane, and you would think that it would be easier to diffuse to this nucleus right from the membrane, because diffusion in the membrane is maybe 10 times slower than in the cytoplasm. But it doesn't come from the cytoplasm. All of the gag that is assembling in this virion over this 10 minutes comes from the cytoplasm. Uh, so to be able to move any further in this uh, kind of thinking about what selects the genomic RNA, we have to try to <laughs> see what the gag is, right? So as Ellen already introduced, it's made of several cellular globular domains, right? And its N-terminal and its C-terminal are the globular domains of matrix that is supposed to bind to the membrane in immature assembled virion, and nucleocapsid that is supposed to bind to the RNA inside the virion. And from mostly studies from Ellen lab, Ellen's lab, we know that this uh, individual gag is highly flexible. In particular, this linker between the uh, N-terminal of capsid and the matrix is 30 amino acid long, completely flexible, unstructured region that is just as good as completely random polymer with a persistent length of one amino acid. So this matrix domain has no problem reaching anywhere uh, in the volume of this protein. So uh, what we also know is that both matrix domain and nucleocapsid domain by either RNA or plasma membrane, electrostatically, competitively, and with about the same affinity. Nucleocapsid binds plasma membrane just as well as RNA, maybe a little better for specific RNA. Uh, and matrix domain binds any RNA non-specifically very strongly, and 
almost as strongly as the plasma membrane, but if it has this meristyl tail, which is hydrophobic uh, tail on it, it's meristylated co-translationally co at its end terminal, then this meristyl allows to bind uh, matrix to the plasma membrane about tenfold stronger. This tenfold stronger is very essential, but the tenfold stronger in terms of the binding free energy gives only the logarithm of 10, which is about 2 kT. So it's stronger, but not that much stronger. Uh, so uh, there is always this competition between gag binding to RNA in the cytoplasm and gag binding to the membrane, right? And the difference in terms of the real binding energy is just this minor preference, essentially, of matrix to membrane because of this hydrocarbon tail. So now... Uh, there is a statement here that is kind of controversial, so that the gag, -gag interactions in immature assembly are weak. And this, uh, so we just heard from Ellen uh, how important they could be, right? And there is no real number placed on how important, how weak or how strong they are. What I was able to estimate on all of the binding data, Ellen's and from our lab and from any lab I could get to, right, is about 2 kT. So the capsid-capsid interactions are not very strong, including the SP1, SP1 interaction when it's turned on because of many gags are together. It's just like another contribution to the short-range gag-gag interaction. There is also an interesting observation that comes from Ellen's, uh, Ellen Ryan's lab that if, we, if he mutates this major dimerization domain of gag in the capsid, WM side, or if he mutates the SP1 region, which is another contribution to gag gag interaction, there is still assembly. So this is a wild type assembly. These are this nice little 100 nanometer virions. And this is the assembly with a major dimerization set of gag mutated. There is some macroscopic structures that contain membrane, uh, dense layer of gag, and RNA in them. They may be not perfect virions, they don't retain the same curvature, but there's still some sort of assemblies with the same components, almost as dense as the normal virions. So the assembly happens, you can say, without gag -ge 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 uh, interaction, which is very strange. So uh, I'm trying to make a s as simple model as I can of this, what happens. And I start with trying to consider the possible binding states of GAG. So the free GAG, I'm, I'm trying to think of the GAG as matrix and C that are both cationic domains connected by a flexible linker. Okay, it's kind of simplistic, and by doing that, I'm neglecting for now, I will then introduce it, the GAG-GAG interactions. So uh, the interactions in physiological south, 150 millimolar, of uh, this particular <laughs> model for GAC with either RNA or membrane are very, very strong. It's 20 KTs. And about 10 KTs comes from matrix and 10 KTs comes from uh, nuclear capsid. So, and they're both binding, of course, at the same time, right? It's the same molecule and very strong two interactions. And these interactions, I'm taking from measured KDs of individual NC domains and matrix domains, measured how they bind to the membrane or how they bind to the uh, RNA, right? And then there is a third bound state of GAG that is in between matrix, in between the plasma membrane and RNA. And it has also the same binding strength here and here. So there, are no, there is no free GAG floating anywhere, right? And everything that's on the membrane is either in that state or in that state. So this state can't assemble, and that state can't assemble. But this state is a nucleus for assembly, even one. All we need for assembly is three things together, the membrane, the linker, which is even one uh, gap, and the RNA. So uh, we can now, uh, because we know the binding free energies of matrix and NC to each either membrane or RNA, uh, the free energy of binding of, uh, let's say, this gag to a membrane is um, this free energies of interaction of individual domains and the entropy cost of localizing the gag, right, which depends on gag concentration in the cytoplasm. And then the free energy of binding this RNA, uh, gag to the RNA 
is the same in terms of interaction with the RNA. And now it's a, a, a entropic cost of localizing this RNA that is in excess over GAG, right? And, um, oh, and when they, we form a triple complex, this complex is very strongly disfavored by the fact that we need to localize both GAG and RNA. So it's disfavored by both of these terms, which are huge. And these terms are uh, on the same order of that, right? But now, uh, let's consider the transitions between the states, right? The free energy differences between band uh, gag bound state to RNA and the extended state. So I want to see how probable is that state, because we are interested in the state as a nucleus for uh, assembly nucleation, right? So these transitions are really driven by a stronger binding of, like, say, in this case, nucleocapsid to RNA as compared to the, uh, so I'm sorry, this is transition from RNA-bound state to RNA and membrane-bound. So this is driven by matrix binding a bit stronger to the membrane than to the RNA. But it's disfavored by the necessity to localize RNA by the membrane, right? So this difference is 2 kT, and this entropy loss is 10 kT. So this is very unfavorable process. And the same is if we want to unbind the RNA, uh, the nucleocapsid from, uh, from the membrane and rebind it to RNA. This is about at most like one KT, one, two KT process that, that drives it. And the entropy loss is again 10 KT, it's huge. I'm constructing a phase diagram for a single gag, right? So these are these free energy differences for these two transitions from the RNA-bound GAG to extended GAG, like this one. And this is the free energy difference between this band GAG on plasma membrane to extended GAG, right? And physiologically, we are always sitting in this kind of situation when we don't have extended GAG at all. It's either all bent on RNA or all bent on the membrane, right? This situation is highly unfavorable. And then, there can be some cases here. So it all depends on the con concentration of GAG and RNA, but physiologically, we are always in this regime, way below. And this is what we need to start the nucleation. So it doesn't happen for one GAG. One GAG can't do that. So now, if we imagine that we have a special RNA that binds not just one, but like say two or maybe three GAGs in the same place, not because they're interacting with each other, but simply because it has a slightly stronger binding sites on this RNA that are all close together sitting here. Now we, this process of this GAGs extending and binding to the membrane has the benefit of three matrices slightly stronger binding to the membrane which makes it instead of two KTs, six KTs for three GAGs, right? And we're getting it at a price of localizing just one RNA, not three RNAs, right? Which makes it much more favorable. So this extended state is much more favorable than just one GAG. One GAG can do that, but two and better three probably can do that. So this is good. Um, but, and these are like coming back to this importance of the three sites together on the psi sequence. Now, why is it, so if we are able to nucleate this nucleus, then the assembly is driven, and it's very strongly driven even in the absence of capsid-capsid interactions, gag-gag interactions. Why is it driven? Because after the structure is made, for whatever reason, if there is a linker between the membrane, negatively charged membrane, and negatively charged long RNA, it's a scaffold for the future assembly. The rest of the GAGs that are sitting in the cytoplasm bound to some random cellular RNAs as monomers, uh, they're joining this, this assembly uh, simply because they want to release the RNA that they're bound to. And this release of the RNA costs 10 kT of entropy that is liberated as the single GAG releases this RNA and joins the scaffold that is already there, pre-made, right? And that drives the assembly pretty strongly without any other components. Uh, so uh, this is how the assembly is driven. And it's essentially the ground state is a macroscopic assembly that is forming. So these are my conclusions that are, how many minutes do I have? 10, seven, yeah. So 
I pretty much already gone through all of that, so I don't want to <laughs> waste time. And I would like to tell you a completely different story about completely different uh, stage of the virus life cycle. This is about uncoating of this completely different capsid, right? So far, we were talking about formation of this immature capsid, right? That is basically a, a layer of the membrane and a layer of RNA and the gag in between, right? And now we are talking about this pretty well-organized crystalline uh, structure that you've seen several times through this meeting already. It's a conical-shaped capsid. And we know it's of very low stability because people who were trying to purify it and study it in labs were having trouble with it for many, many years because it's a very low stability structure. But you can make a structure of it without purifying it inside the membrane. And you can do cryo it and all sorts of structural uh, studies. And the structure of it by now is known with a, like, say, three angstrom resolution. It's a most well-defined structure. It was very well modeled by Klaus Schulman, Schulten's lab. And uh, the question that was there for years, so like about maybe five years ago, people would always say, and it was written in textbooks, that this structure, as it gets into the cytoplasm of infected cell, that it immediately falls apart. And the reverse transcription that follows happens in the cytoplasm of infected cell. And there was no question about that. It was kind of a textbook uh, notion. So um, about five, six years ago, people started to question that. And to me, it was also always a puzzle when I learned about it, because what makes the reverse transcription is a very special polymerase that is a viral protein that is completely absent in any sort of mammalian cell. It's a reverse transcriptase that uses the RNA as a template to make DNA. And also, it can use the same, the same uh, polymerase uses the single-stranded DNA to make another DNA, to make a double-stranded DNA, proviral DNA, right? So there are just 200 copies of this tRNA inside this mature capsid. And if mature capsid is gone, then this RT will be also gone because it's an unspecifically binding nucleic acid binding protein that can bind to any RNA in the cytoplasm. So there will be no reverse transcription if the encoding happens prior to reverse transcription. So I would expect that the capsid should stay almost till the end of reverse transcription. But it was not known. So uh, this is the typical picture, that the infection happens, the capsid falls apart, the reverse transcription happens, the double-stranded DNA is then made in the cytoplasm and then somehow transported through the nuclear pore and gets inserted into the human genome. The later picture that comes from the studies starting like 2009 is that the mature core can survive all the way through reverse transcription, can come to the nuclear pore, and at this point there is an encoding happening and the DNA is somehow pushed through the pore and that the capsid even can help to localize the double-stranded DNA to the pore and to transport it inside. So just to remind you that this, these are two completely different immature and mature variants. And what happens here is that the gag is processed into components. And what assembles into the mature capsid is just the capsid. The matrix stays by the membrane. The nuclear capsid that is bound to RNA is processed from capsid and aggregates with nucleic acid with RNA inside this uh, capsid, and it takes up a very small volume of this capsid. The RNA condensed by nuclear capsid is a small little dark spot on this TM images in this mature capsid. So there is no problem of packaging this viral RNA inside mature capsid because of the nuclear capsid, because it's a very strongly condensing agent. And the way it condenses the nucleic acid, just coming back to that, the way that nucleic capsid condenses nucleic acid is pretty much like multivalent cations can condense any sort of nucleic acid. I believe it's a, a counter ion correlation mechanism that a lot of people in this room had worked on before, just like cobalt hexamine or spermidine or spermin would condense any sort of nucleic acid. It's a multivalent cation with a charge three and a half nucleic acid protein. So now there was a notion for a very long time that this capsid uh, should be good for reverse transcription. There are about you know, 10 to 8 nanometer holes 
in this structure that are transparent to nucleotides and, like, say, to uh, reverse transcription inhibitors, but they're not transparent to any other larger molecules, for example, even to the smallest protein like nucleocapsid, 55 amino acids. But the reverse transcription was observed for years, endogenous reverse transcription. Pe people had this uh, cone inside the membrane as it is purified in purified virions. And people permeabilize this membrane with a detergent and add uh, nucleotides, and the reverse transcription goes just fine, no problem. There are no enzymes, no cellular proteins, no nothing needed for reverse transcription. And lately, just recently, few, one month ago, I have heard of people observing the complete reverse transcription now in the virions in vivo, in mature capsids, uh, without shells. So it definitely happens. So also, there is just a recent, this year, publication in science that shows that this little pores, eight nanometer pores in the mature capsid, are not only transparent to, to nucleotides, but they're actually actively transporting nucleotides. They're made to transport the nucleotides inside. And it is a very efficient, fast process. And the slight mutations It's just made, I don't think it consumes the energy, but they're made of five arginines, positively charged sitting right, right here, that are very efficiently binding and then releasing inside. It's made kind of, it's designed, right? And very small uh, mutations in this uh, pore make a huge difference on the rate of reverse transcription. So uh, there were early studies of the interrelationship between the reverse transcription that might happen inside this capsid and the rate of uncoding as it was observed in vivo. So the rate of uncoding was quantified by measuring the amount of capsid in the capsid as a function of time post-infection. And the uncoding happens about an hour after infection. So the capsids fall apart. They don't know if they fall apart at once or gradually. They just measure how they fall apart over time post-infection. And if uh, they uh, halt the reverse transcription with nevirapine, which is the reverse transcription inhibitor, then the encoding just doesn't happen. The, um, the cone, this mature cone, sits there forever. And at the same time, they're monitoring the progress of reverse transcription. And in this early study, it wasn't the reverse transcription in the same capsids that were falling apart, just the rate of reverse transcription post-infection. And the reverse transcription products that happen, the late reverse transcription, which means double-stranded DNA, appear at about the same time that the, reverse trans that the encoding happens. And that is a link between the reverse transcription and the encoding. They have the same time. And also, if the capsid is stabilized, so the unstable capsid falls apart much faster, and the stable capsid survives much longer. And uh, if the capsid stability is modified, like by capsid mutations, artificial capsid mutations, or by changing the host cell proteins that stabilize or destabilize this capsid binding to it in the cytoplasm, then the infectivity of the virus is affected like thousand times, many, many times. It's a huge effect on infectivity. So now, Getting back to thinking about reverse transcription happening in this mature capsid. So it is absolutely critical that the nucleocapsid inside this capsid is condensed. The condensing agent is this nucleocapsid protein that Ellen talked extensively about, so I don't need to talk about it. What I want to say is that in the salt, um, salt competition assays, essentially measuring the KD as a function of salt that Ellen talked about, it looks just like uh, cation with a charge three and a half. And it's fairly nonspecific. It has some specificity that Ellen also talked about that's coming from this aromatic residue stacking with the Gs, but it's fairly moderate specificity. And we know what happens to RNA or DNA if we add to it, like, say, cobalt hexamine and spermidine. Uh, this is the double-stranded DNA condensed with cobalt hexamine or spermidine, and these are classical experiments and what we know about it is that all of the double-stranded DNA within a second compacts in the toroidal structures, right? I assume that the nucleocapsid does exactly the same to either single-stranded DNA or double-stranded DNA that is being made in course of reverse transcription. 
So thinking that, Robin and I had made a theory how RNA is being transformed into a double-stranded DNA using this uh, reverse transcription, RT polymerization. And this is a very rigid structure. This is a very compact structure. The self-volume of complete, completely done DNA is the same as a single-stranded DNA, but it's rigid. So it needs compact, to be compacted by a nucleic acid protein that is there. If there is a little hole in the capsid, the nucleic acid will escape, and this toroid will decondense, and that will be the end of reverse transcription, complete blow up of the capsid, right? And there is a balance between the self-attraction induced by a nucleic capsid that makes the size of this toroid uh, that is pushing on the capsid and the elasticity of this capsid. And by considering these two things, elasticity of the capsid and the, of the toroid, we made a phase diagram for what volume of the double-stranded DNA inside the capsid or what length of the DNA being made inside the capsid can be withstanded by the... So on this axis is a self-attraction of DNA by nucleic capsid. On this axis is the volume fraction of the double-stranded DNA inside the capsid, and the different lines correspond to different capsid stabilities. So if the capsid has no stability, just upon toroid touching it, it falls apart, that is how much of the DNA it can tolerate being made inside. But if the capsid is more stable, then it can tolerate a little more DNA being made inside. If the capsid is too stable, it will never be uncoated. So just now, this year, there appeared the first AFM studies of the capsid. Uh, so this is mature capsid on the AFM grid being scanned, scanned by AFM. At some point, the reverse transcription is induced by adding nucleotides to it, and it's still sitting on this AFM grid. And at some point, there is a filament that pushes on the capsid from the inside, and that makes this kind of bump in the shape of the mature capsid. And this kind of filament that they can trace with AFM appears at the same time that the rigidity of the capsid that they can also measure by AFM goes up and then the, caps, the capsid is kind of, the rigidity goes to zero. Uh, and they can also measure that if the capsid is overstabilized by mutating the capsid, then uh, there is a, this increase in the capsid rigidity that corresponds to the filament formation in the capsid. But the capsid never disassembles. It just relaxes to some more or less previous rigidity. Okay, so it looks like this FM data supports our picture of uh, mature capsid being blown up by reverse transcription happening inside it. That's pretty much. Thank you.